This video and eventual morning of what was the AAF is brought to you by SeatGeek. It's an app that aggregates all tickets available on the resale market to help you get the best possible price on tickets. Color coding all seats from red to green on a 1 to 100 scale, it can even let you get a view from where you'll be sitting before buying. You can be scanned into the games from the app itself, making it easy to use. If you're still eager to try it out, use the code word TREE in the link below to save $20 off your first purchase. That's the power of SeatGeek for you. I would have done this in my normal style, but in this situation it would be rather tasteless. I'm not that cruel. It's funny how things can change by snapping your fingers. In a normal timeline, this video would be a general recap of weeks 8 and 9 of the AAF season. I would be talking about the Apollo's push for a championship, I'd be making references to incredibly old memes. I'd probably debate if Birmingham, Arizona, or San Antonio had a chance at beating Orlando. But alas, this was not meant to be. On April 2nd, the hardcore following of the league was shaken. The AAF suspended operations indefinitely. There were rumors and grumblings of such a fate the week beforehand, something surprisingly not new to the Alliance, but there was hope they'd at least finish the season. What would be the fate of the playoff contenders will now never be known. To think that a league that started out with such hype would not only stall out, but be burned to nothing but ember roughly two months later. It's something I didn't expect, but this is reality. We must face an uncomfortable truth. From a management and logistics perspective, this league was a total shit show. In a way, the Alliance didn't even have a chance to get off of the ground. There are too many things to point the finger at, but there's one constant in all of it. They tried to fly way too early into its life cycle. Let's go over the whole idea of a startup. There's significant planning and preparation needed before the business even opens. Organizing your core philosophies and mission statement, negotiating with purveyors and suppliers, hiring labor. Getting everything set up and developed alone can sink a company if it's done poorly. In this failure, a few culprits are usually at hand. Vastly underestimating startup costs, poor execution and support for the business, and or lack of starting capital. For all the talk they had about being patient and avoiding the mistakes the XFL did, they sure as hell repeated a lot of them. They played games only a year after announcing the league. Ironically, this was just after the XFL had announced that they were reviving. It takes more than a year to develop the networks and logistics of a professional football league. It's not just the written agreements, but all of that government red tape needed to be passed for legality. What rushing caused was a mess that had many visible cracks from the get-go. Want a poster child? Look no further than the league's darling Orlando Apollos. Great team, right? Well, what you may not know is after playing in Orlando, they would travel to their hotel in Jacksonville. To practice, the Apollos would have to go to a different state thanks to workers' comp issues. The league couldn't find an insurance carrier. I'd say make sure your employees are taken care for, but more on that later. It's not even just them. Look at the Atlanta legends and their instability. They had a head coach in Brad Childress until he resigned a month before play. They had an offensive coordinator in Michael Vick before he also resigned before the season. More rubbing in the wound, the replacement offensive coordinator, yes, quit after the first week. The Salt Lake Stallions didn't even feel like they had their own identity. They didn't even try to hide that they played in a college stadium. University of Utah logos and branding everywhere the eye could see. Their piss poor attendance was the least of their issues. Arizona suffered attendance woes not seen since the Cardinals played at Sun Devil Stadium. Atlanta, same thing. Memphis, their team just sucked. Why would people go there to see Christian Hackenberg? Even though we don't know the overhead costs, we can confirm they were rather significant due to the allegations of not being able to meet payroll. After week two. How does that happen, you ask? By taking the wrong funding. The main financier for their initial launch was a man named Reggie Fowler, whom had promised $170 million to keep the league afloat. Should last a season, you'd say. Only problem was that Fowler wasn't exactly reliable. Trusting your league to a guy who had defaulted on several seven-figure loans and lost his companies in a receivership sounds like a foolproof plan. Little did they know that Fowler either didn't have the money or pulled a fast one. He first got his funding by over 80% to $28 million, and then that money never actually materialized. Despite the exterior at week one looking really good at first glance, the AAF was already close to being fucked. The executives had to scramble, and with revenues being very thin thanks to low attendance and minimal TV coverage, they had to do it fast. Nearing a crisis point, the AAF had to make a deal with the devil. His name ended up being Tom Dundon. Sure, he bailed out the league. Sure, he was hailed as a hero at the time, but here are the 25 catches in this deal. He didn't have to invest the full 250 million. He could pull out of funding at any moment if he's dissatisfied, and the executive brass gave him sole autonomy of the league. It was the equivalent of a corporate takeover with Dundon playing venture capitalist. This led to a league with a mishmash of differing visions and plans for the AAF. When a business, any business, doesn't have a sound plan for the future, it is doomed. 
There were those that wanted the AAF to develop its own brand. There were some that wanted to wait a few years before partnering with the NFL, and there were guys like Tom Dundon, incredibly impatient and demanded a merger immediately. A boiling point was about to be reached. Dundon would be blunt. The NFLPA needed to give them players and funding, or else. Let's be real for a second, what the hell would that even do? Best case scenario, they'd be getting practice squad fodder or bench warmers. The improvement in the quality of play would be marginal at best. The NFLPA would take all the liability with next to no benefit. The NFL could use a minor league, but it doesn't need one. Especially one as much of a mess as the AAF was. With this bluff call, Dundon made himself an enemy of many football fans for life and shut down the league. The disorganization was laid bare for all to see. Purveyors and suppliers never being paid for services. Players and coaches suddenly left unemployed and forced to pay their own way home. Those injured in the league now shit out of luck. They now had to pay their own bills for hospital stays and rehab. It was amateur, it was classless, and it was fitting of such a logistical shit show. Charlie Ebersol telling everyone these sweet little lies about having three years of funding and being patient. The league being more about its tech than the football? What tech? The app that barely worked and was unreliable or the gambling aspect of it where you couldn't gamble? The only thing this league got right was the football. It was inspired, the players were hungry, everyone on the field wanted to be there. Even then there were issues. The quarterback play was sloppy, but that's an issue the NFL deals with as well. There were some really ugly games, but there are ugly games in every league. I know the popular thing is to blame Tom Dundon and call him the AAF's version of Donald Trump, but let me play devil's advocate. If it weren't for Dundon, this league folds in week three. His funding merely delayed the inevitable. Was it shitty the way he shut down the league? Absolutely. Did he do it to try and gain the rights to the gambling tech? We can't tell since he never got it. Is he the main reason the league folded? It honestly isn't. Why aren't more people blaming Ebersol and Polian for this? They rushed the league, they took the wrong money twice and put all of their eggs in one basket from the start. They created the setting for the shutdown in the first place. Hell, they were even sued by a former business associate who claimed a handshake deal. That's not how you start such an enterprise. It's just sad to me because the end result is that countless players, coaches, and behind the scenes personnel are out of jobs and will get no recourse for it. The AAF says they are thinking about bringing back the brand in the future, but you can't recover from this. Your reputation is destroyed. Who's going to come to a league that betrayed its core tenants and left its employees out in the cold? Now it makes me less optimistic about the XFL, but they seem to have their funding in order. There was some good that came out of this league. Many players that wouldn't get a chance to shine did and have signed NFL contracts. San Antonio would be a great place for a future NFL franchise with their backing of the Commanders. There is a niche that will follow spring football. But in the end, it's just not enough to overcome the mess that remains. No, Charlie, this league wasn't like the XFL at all. That league at least finished a season. The only guarantee from here on out are lawsuits as far as the eye can see. What a waste.